What's up, humans, and welcome to a new Psychoactivo. Happy Tuesday, everybody. Okay, second video of the day. I was expecting for this to happen. I was expecting for this interview to take place. I already knew that it was happening. I am happy to report to you guys that I am in constant communication with Dr. Villarroel. She's been really nice. I tried to ask her about the details and data because I am not a scientist. I'm a layman, and I wanted to get my previous videos about her discovery correct and she was really nice and really generous with her time so i could get the best possible data out there in my videos so she obviously has been bombarded with requests for interviews and the first one she did was for la tribuna from the basque country uh, this was an interview conducted by mr raul gonzalez sorrilla who is the director at La Tribuna in the Basque Country. And that was the first ever interview she did after the paper. She basically confirmed what many feared because what startled her really was the fact that uh, about 80,000 of the 100,000 transients that they discovered in these astronomical plates from the Palomar survey are or could be artificial. And they went through many different stages of the investigation to rule out whatever explanation can be considered as prosaic. And those 80,000 are concerning because that was just a little tiny part of the earth. It wasn't all of it. So just imagine if she found 80,000 in that little part, imagine how many more there were at that time. So we can already start calling this the pre-Sputnik grid hypothesis. The pre-Sputnik grid hypothesis. Why? Because these anomalies and these transient objects that are reflective were found before 1957, which is when Sputnik was uh, sent out to the orbit. That's the first ever human satellite that was sent out of Earth. And before that, anything that was found there that was even remotely artificial, just think about it. What could it be? And that's why I was really happy that the first English interview she did was with Ross Coulthard, who is always very thorough in the questioning he, he does. And he's always very specific about potential debunks of the case. And he was very clear about many of them. And they ruled those out as the interview went on. There is a specific part that I want to play for you guys, and let's talk afterwards. And then we'll go to the actual moment that I would guarantee you guys got Dr. Villarreal really, really stressed out and nervous. Because as one of the leading scientists in her area, and the way the stigma has persisted for many decades, I would be scared too. because. She is a trailblazer in many respects. She's one of the first people who is considered part of the mainstream scientific establishment in Europe who dared to say these words. I know that Dr. Gary Nolan is another one of those because he's also part of the mainstream scientific establishment, whether people like it or not. The man has done incredible work in cancer research, and he's one of the most knowledgeable people in the topic. But Dr. Villarroel got the chance to say the words and she did and let's play the video of ross asking one of the most pressing questions first and let's see the analysis and the back and forth that these two have suggests something technological are we talking here beatrice about the possibility of a non-human technology that was surveilling this planet at that peak moment in UFO history? I don't find any other way of uh, um, looking at this data. I think, uh, I mean, if I take the pieces together that some of them fall on a line, our best cases happen during the Washington DC flap by coincidence. There is temporal correlations with the nuclear bomb tests and with UFO sightings. And on top of it... Because that's another important distinction. The research that she did also 
made a correlation with the nuclear tests that were happening at the time. So that's another correlation for a potential non-human presence or an artificial technology presence pre-Sputnik era. Because we're, we'll go a little deeper into that because one of the theories that they also touched on, and that is something that I also refuse to ignore, is the fact that these could also be some type of ancient technology that we still don't know uh, exists or we have no idea that it exists. And we're just confusing it with non-human intelligence. That could also very well be a possibility because we don't know the civilizations that came before us, if they did pre-Ice Age, we don't know how advanced they were. We don't know if they went a different route compared to us when the Industrial Revolution happened and when Tesla and Edison were fighting for essentially get hold of the energy market at the start of the 20th century. We have no idea if there was another civilization that took the Tesla road, for example, or another road. I don't know. Uh, so that's another possibility. But let's continue with this one. It's, there's a huge deficit in the shadow of the Earth. For me, this looks technological. But What's I'm really uh... wrong. Maybe the, there's some new physical phenomenon that I haven't, that nobody knows about yet, but to me, it looks very high tech. For me, I'm not a statistician, but I really sat up straight when I read the statistical likelihood that this is something that is ruled out by the Earth's shadow as being, a, you know, a, perhaps a, a plate glitch or something like that. What have you learned statistically from testing whether these transients appeared in the Earth's shadow? Well, I've learned that to have this deficit by chance is a uh, extremely low probability to happen by chance. I think it's bigger probability that one gets eaten up by a supermassive black hole tomorrow than that this happens by chance. That's how improbable uh, it appears to be. It all leads to this next moment but before that i just want to show you this this is like a render of this discovery that uh, dr villarreal has made and there's also a correlation with a theory from a gentleman by the name of patrick jackson who i've told you guys about before who has a theory where multiple different sphere systems uh, could be a potential safeguard of earth a grid it's very similar to what Dr. Villarreal has seen in those plates. And I think it's an interesting correlation, too, that we have to point out. So shout out to Patrick. They showed these images as well, which is part of the paper. And a lot of people got confused with that because they thought that these were the, the things that were caught on the plates. Those are just representations or examples of the possible shapes that appeared on those plates. That's it. And this is the famous candidate number five, which is uh, a depiction of these objects that were happening right around the same time when the 1952 UFO flap from Washington, D.C. took place in July. And there are a few correlations that we have to make there because just a month prior to that, the father of rocketry on June 17th, which is my birthday and Art Bell's birthday, Jack Parsons died. He exploded uh, while he was conducting an experiment. And almost exactly a month after that, the flap happened and these plates were recorded, which show like a formation of objects that were there at some point, then they, they moved to a different position. And this happened during that year. So. That's probably one of the most significant correlations that Dr. Villarroel found because it ties directly into other plates that were also recorded, but in Harvard, a third of those were destroyed by former Harvard Astronomy Department Director Howard Mansell. And this is part of uh, a conspiracy theory that has been, has perdured for many years called the Mansell Conspiracy which talks about Dr. Menzel arriving at Harbor, destroying those plates, and then prohibiting for any more recording of the skies when he was 
in power, but he didn't know at the same time that the Palomar Observatory was also recording these plates in similar locations. So this is what Dr. Villarreal wanted to study when the, the plates were digitized. So that's that. And then all of this and the whole conversation is going to be in the description so you guys can check it out. But we have to look at this final part, which is the phrase that I think for a scientist like Dr. Villarreal is very important to mutter out in public in a setting like this. I think that News Nation was probably one of the best places she could have done it first. And then as this one catches more attention, she should go on even bigger uh, networks and shows and the more mainstream because although News Nation is considered mainstream as well, they are very UFO friendly and we know them for that. But we need her to be on the slightly lesser UFO friendly shows and talk about this with peers of hers listening to what she has to say. But this is a fantastic start, in my opinion. So here is the phrase from Dr. Villarreal. I mean, in, inside that fairly dense prose is an awesome probability. The possibility or probability that there were artificial technological objects in geosynchronous orbit at a period in human history when we weren't in orbit that someone yeah. else was there. We are probably not alone. <laughs> Is that your strong view as you get more and more into this research? I guess I would rather say we are never alone. That's the phrase. And she has a good, strong case to make that claim based on the findings. And I, I can understand that she can be nervous or uh, maybe even a little paranoid sometimes because of the pressure that she's been feeling. But we should all just let her know in any way we can. She's on Twitter. She's very active there uh, that she has all our full support and that everybody's proud of what she's doing. And we are, Dr. Villarreal. We're all proud and very happy that you decided to come forward. And I can't wait to talk to you whenever that happens. Let me know what you think in the comments about the interview, about these uh, exchanges with Ross Coldheart, about the concept of the pre-Sputnik grid, and about that connection with the 1952 flap. I think that's a really interesting one and one of the most significant. Let me know what you think. If you like the content you see, I'm going to ask you to like, share, comment, subscribe, and hit the bell icon. That's all you need to do in order to help us, and it is what helps us the most, so thank you. But if you want to support us in other ways, there's a few links you can choose from. You can become a member on YouTube or you can support us through KGRA. Anything you choose to do is always appreciated. So thank you. That's it for me today on this video, but I'll see you guys in the next one. But remember, stay curious and inquisitive like Dr. Beatriz Villarroel. Always. Bye.